fatal encounter at a shopping complex between a nosy thug and a rapper who didn't want to be identified, and the violent demise of a jealous hoodlum who thought his former high school mate turned rapper would be easy prey, are a few incidents where some goons have met their undoing after messing with rappers who take the thug life a little too seriously. The Baby's Deadly Walmart Encounter before the world knew him as DaBaby, Jonathan Kirk was just another ambitious artist from Charlotte, North Carolina, hustling to make a name for himself in the rap game. With a distinctive flow and an unapologetic presence, Kirk was on the cusp of fame, dropping tracks and videos that were slowly gaining traction on YouTube and SoundCloud. His local fan base was growing, and so were his aspirations for a major record deal. Fast forward to the fateful day of November 5th, 2018, when the trajectory of DaBaby's life would take a dramatic turn. It was a day like any other at Walmart in Charlotte, where families shuffled through aisles, carts brimming with goods. Among the shoppers was DaBaby, accompanied by his then-partner Mariah Osborne and their two young children looking to buy winter clothes for the upcoming season. But as the fluorescent lights hummed overhead, a chance encounter was brewing, one that would end in tragedy. Jalen Craig, a 19-year-old, and his friend Henry Douglas entered the store, fresh off a shift and in search of thermals to keep warm at their job. Little did they know, their paths were about to cross with DaBaby. As Craig and Douglas navigated the aisles, they recognized the rapper, not by his flashy attire or entourage, but by his mere presence. The baby, dressed unassumingly and focused on family shopping, seemed out of place to the young fans, who were used to seeing the larger-than-life persona he projected in his videos. Curiosity peaked. They took a few extra glances, trying to confirm if it was indeed the artist. The rapper, sensing the stares, felt his privacy being invaded. In a world where image is everything, and the lines between personal space and public persona are blurred, the baby's reaction was one of annoyance. Later reports said he believed the teens were sizing him up, possibly with with ill intentions. The atmosphere tensed as what started as a fan's recognition turned into a perceived threat. The situation escalated when DaBaby confronted the young men. Words were exchanged and tensions rose. Kirk, feeling provoked and protective of his family, suggested taking the matter outside. Douglas, who had never been in a fight before, hoped to de-escalate the situation by agreeing to leave, thinking they could simply drive away. But as they attempted to walk past DaBaby, the rapper's patience snapped. Surveillance footage would later show DaBaby launching a surprise attack on Douglas, striking him in the face and igniting a physical altercation. The sudden violence left Douglas with a bruised eye socket and a gash on his forehead that required stitches. Craig, standing nearby, appeared to pull out a gun from his waistband but seemed to reconsider as he moved out of frame. Mariah Osborne tried to intervene in the chaos, pushing Craig and striking him. It was then that DaBaby, breaking free from the scuffle with Douglas, drew a concealed .40 caliber Glock from his waistband and fired, hitting Craig in the side. The teenager stumbled away, leaving a trail of blood before collapsing in an aisle where he would soon be pronounced dead. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, Walmart became a crime scene. Shoppers were ushered out as police tape cordoned off the aisles where a young life had been abruptly ended. The baby, now a suspect in a homicide investigation, was taken into custody, his future hanging in the balance. The news of the shooting spread like wildfire, igniting a media frenzy. Headlines splashed across screens and papers, painting a grim picture of the altercation. The baby, who had been on the brink of stardom found his name in the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. The incident was dissected in the court of public opinion, with many quick to pass judgment based on the rapper's persona and lyrics that often glorified violence. As the legal proceedings began, the narrative DaBaby presented was one of self-defense. He claimed that he had acted out of fear for his and his family's safety, stating that Craig and Douglas had threatened him and brandished a firearm. This version of events was initially supported by witness testimony and the weapon found near Craig's body, leading authorities to believe that Craig had been armed at the time of the confrontation. Despite the controversy, the case was closed on June 2019 without prosecuting Day Baby for Craig's death. He was, however, charged and convicted of carrying a concealed weapon and sentenced to 12 months probation with a suspended jail. The decision not to charge him further was met with outrage from the Craig family, who felt that justice had not been served. NLE Choppa's Bloody Beach Altercation since his breakthrough in the music industry, NLE Choppa, born Bryson Potts, has enjoyed a meteoric rise in the rap industry, with a string of successful singles propelling him into the spotlight. However, alongside his top charting hits, NLE Choppa has also grown a reputation for violence, often getting himself into a beef with fellow rappers and altercations with fans. An incident that shows just how quickly things can go violent around NLE Choppa occurred in 2021 on a sun-drenched day at Venice Beach in California, where Choppa and his crew were just enjoying the 
serene atmosphere of the boardwalk, which was quickly shattered by a confrontation that would quickly escalate into a physical altercation as he strolled down the boardwalk, attempting to soak in the tranquility of the ocean and the casual bustle of the beachgoers. His path intersected with a man on a bicycle, a goon, as some might label him, who saw an opportunity to engage with the rapper. The man, whose identity remained a mystery to the public, approached NLE Chopper with a request, a picture to capture the moment. It was a request that on any other day might have been met with a smile and a moment of shared camaraderie, but not this day. Chopper was in no mood for photographs. He sought only to enjoy his time without the trappings of fame. Politely, he declined the man's request, hoping that would be the end of the exchange. However, the goon was not one to take no for an answer. Insistent and perhaps feeling slighted by the rejection, he resorted to name-calling, hurling insults at the young rapper, branding him scared and a bitch. It was a provocation that cut deep, challenging not just Chapa's desire for privacy, but also his very character. The situation escalated quickly. Words gave way to shoves and shoves to punches. A crowd began to gather, drawn by the commotion and the recognition of the rapper at its center. One woman who happened to be recording the scene provided a running commentary that would later accompany the viral footage of the brawl. They are fighting. He's a famous rapper, she narrated, her voice tinged with disbelief. As the altercation intensified, NLE Chapa and his entourage were embroiled in a physical struggle with the man. The bystanders' exclamations of, oh, sh punctuated the air, a soundtrack to the flurry of blows being exchanged. The woman's voice rose in concern. I can't stop this. I cannot stop this. <laughs> That's too many people, that's not fair. Her cries of, that's not fair, echoed the sentiment of the onlookers, but the fight raged on. NLE Chapa, who had once declared his intention to eschew violence in his music and personal life, was now at the center of a very public and very violent episode. It starkly contrasted the image he had been cultivating, one of positivity and personal growth. In the aftermath of the brawl, NLE Chapa took to Twitter to defend his actions and set the record straight. He painted a picture of a man simply trying to enjoy a peaceful walk on the beach, whose hand was forced by disrespect and aggression. Damn, y'all never got hit in a fight before, he posted, his message a mix of incredulity and defiance. He spoke of his willingness to take pictures with fans, but emphasized that sometimes he just wanted to chill. Despite his efforts to downplay the incident, NLE's violent side has been prevalent since he became famous, most especially in 2022 when he got into an altercation with a passerby at the airport. However, it wasn't just any passerby, but a fan of Young Boy Never Broke Again, a rapper with whom Chapa has had a complicated history. The fan, emboldened by allegiance and perhaps seeking to provoke, confronts Chapa with a pointed question, are you NLE? The inquiry hangs heavy in the air, a challenge more than a question. Chapa's response is lost in the chaos, but the intent behind his words is clear. This is his ground, and he will not be disrespected. In a moment that will soon flood social media feeds, the fan makes a move, a punch is thrown, and the altercation turns physical. Phones are out, recording every second as the two grapple amidst the shocked onlookers. Whether it lands or not, the fan's punch is a catalyst for what happens next. Chapa, caught off guard but not defeated, retaliates. He refuses to back down, despite the advantage of fighting in flip-flop. He slips, a momentary lapse that the fan interprets as victory, but the rapper is quick to recover. The scuffle is brief yet intense, a physical manifestation of the ongoing rivalry between fan bases and the rappers they support. The fight ended as quickly as it began, leaving behind a trail of viral videos and a surge of online commentary. G Herbo and Lil Bibby stage squabble in the heart of Chicago's South Shore, where the streets whispered tales of hardship and survival, two young boys found solace and expression through the beats and rhymes of hip hop. Lil Bibby and G Herbo, born Brandon Dickinson and Herbert Wright respectively, met as kids at a local youth center, a place that would become the crucible for their burgeoning talents. Their friendship, built on a shared environment and a passion for music, would soon evolve into a powerful artistic partnership. The duo's journey began with innocent tape recordings on cell phones, with beats playing in the background as they honed their skills. It was raw, unfiltered, and purely for the love of the craft. But as their talents grew, so did their ambition. In the teens, they released Kill Shit, a track that resonated with the stark realities of their upbringing, and it became an anthem that echoed through the streets of Chicago and beyond. This was more than a hit. It was a statement, a declaration of their arrival on the hip-hop scene. Both Lil Bibby and G Herbo became alumni of XXL Magazine's prestigious freshman class, a nod to the industry's recognition of their potential. As their solo careers took flight, 
flight. They never lost sight of their roots, frequently performing together and even collaborating on an album. No limitations, a testament to their unbreakable bond and shared vision. However, in 2016, the duo took the stage at Toad's Place in New Haven, Connecticut for what was expected to be a night of lyrical prowess and raw energy from Lil Bibby and G Herbo. But amidst the excitement, an unforeseen event would soon cast a shadow over the evening. The altercation was intense and the safety of everyone involved was at risk. Initial reports suggested that the chaos was sparked by an attempted chain snatching by an unknown goon targeting Lil Bibby's prized jewelry. The speculation was fueled by the sight of Bibby handing his chains to a friend or bodyguard, a move interpreted by onlookers as a protective response to a perceived threat. The story of the chain snatching attempt spread like wildfire, with many quick to jump to conclusions about the motives and the identities of those involved. The incident was sensationalized, with the media often emphasizing the drama and the potential for violence that comes with the territory of rap stardom. However, during an interview with Vlad TV, G Herbo's response to the incident painted a different picture. With a calm and collected demeanor, he addressed the rumors head on, dismissing the allegations of a chain snatching attempt as internet propaganda. Herbo clarified that no one had tried to reach for their chains, not at that show or any other. Instead, he described the altercation as a spontaneous scuffle that broke out between their party and some security guards, a regular stuff occurrence that escalated unexpectedly. Gucci Mane's fatal encounter with Henry Lee Clark III. The year was 2005, a pivotal moment in hip-hop history, when two of the South's rising stars, Jeezy and Gucci Mane, collided over a track that was destined to become a Southern anthem. The song in question was Icy, a catchy number that showcased both rappers' unique styles and was poised to catapult them into the spotlight. However, what should have been a celebratory collaboration soon turned sour, igniting one of the most notorious feuds in rap history. Thug Motivation 101, Gucci Mane, known for his flamboyant persona and slick rhymes, was preparing his first independent independent album, Trap House. When the two joined forces on Icy, it was a meeting of rap titans in the making. The track was a hit, peaking at number 46 on Billboard's R&B slash hip hop chart and resonating with fans across the South. But the harmony was short lived. Jeezy claimed that he was under the impression that Icy would feature on his album. Instead, Gucci Mane used the track for Trap House, a move that didn't sit well with Jeezy. To add insult to injury, Jeezy alleged that he was never compensated for his contribution to the song. This perceived betrayal was the spark that ignited a fiery exchange of diss tracks and public insults. The tension escalated when Jeezy released Stay Strapped, a track that put a bounty on Gucci Mane's chain. I got a bounty on that shit, n 10 stacks, Jeezy rapped, signaling to aspiring gangbangers that if they snatched Gucci's chain, a $10,000 reward would be theirs. This was no longer just about music. The stakes had been raised and the streets were watching. Gucci Mane was quick to respond with round one, a direct hit at Jeezy. That young Jeezy, man, that fake, Gucci declared before the beat even dropped, setting the tone for a no-holds-barred lyrical battle. Gucci was ready for war, and the chorus of round one made it clear that he saw this as just the beginning of a lengthy feud. The war of words soon took a dark and violent turn. It was May 10th, 2005, a date that would become etched in hip-hop infamy. Gucci Mane, fresh off the release of his debut album, Trap House, was visiting a friend's apartment in Decatur, Georgia, when the unexpected happened. Four men, cloaked in the anonymity of black attire, forced their way into the home of a female friend, where Gucci Mane and his associates were gathered. The intruders, one of whom was Pookie Locke, real name Henry Lee Clark III, didn't come for pleasantries. They came with ill intentions, sparking a confrontation that would escalate into a life or death struggle. Pookie Locke, a Macon, Georgia native, was more than just an aggressor that night. He was a man with a history and a rap sheet that spoke to a life of entanglements with the law, having been arrested more than 20 times. But beyond the mug shots and the criminal records, he was a rapper too, associated with corporate thugs Thugs Entertainment, a label linked to Jeezy, Gucci Mane's rival at the time. The altercation turned deadly when shots rang out. When the dust settled, Pookie Lock lay lifeless. His body was later discovered in a wooded area near Columbia Middle School. The aftermath was swift and severe. Gucci Mane, born Radrick Davis, turned himself into authorities on May 19th, facing the grim reality of a murder charge. He claimed self-defense, stating that he had fired his weapon only in response to being attacked. The legal battle that ensued was fraught with tension and uncertainty. Gucci Mane's fate hung in the balance as prosecutors worked to piece together the events of that fateful night. But the case took a pivotal turn when a witness, the owner of the condo, stepped forward. Their testimony corroborated Gucci Mane's account, painting a picture of an attempted robbery or assault rather than a premeditated attack. In January 2006, the charges against Gucci Mane were dropped, the district attorney citing insufficient evidence to proceed with a murder trial. The possibility of the case being reopened lingered, contingent on new evidence coming to light. But for Gucci Mane, it was a moment of reprieve, albeit a temporary one, as he was 
was already serving time for an unrelated assault charge. The hip-hop community watched as the saga unfolded with Jeezy, whose real name is J. Wayne Jenkins, addressing the tragedy in his music. In his 2015 song, Forgive Me, Jeezy sang of Pookie Lock's death, expressing sorrow but vehemently denying any involvement in the incident. The lyrics spoke to a decade of accusations that he had sent his friend on a dummy mission, a claim he sought to dispel through his art. Gucci Mane's career, though marred by this incident, did not falter. He continued to release music, his narrative now intertwined with the night that changed everything. CTS Lewick Road Rage Incident it was around 2 o'clock on August 26th when 18-year-old Michael Henderson, known in the rap game as CTS Lou Wick, found himself riding his motorcycle down the bustling Broadway street. Joseph Raymond Shaw, a 42-year-old man, was behind the wheel of a white Jeep, his presence on the road about to intersect with Henderson's in the most tragic of ways. As the two vehicles traveled parallel to each other, a tension-filled moment unfolded. Henderson maneuvered his motorcycle in front of Shaw's Jeep. In a split second, Henderson reached back towards Shaw and with a calculated aim, shot him in the forehead. The impact was immediate and fatal. Shaw's life ended in that instant, his Jeep crashing at the intersection of Nebraska Avenue and South Broadway Street, leaving onlookers in a state of disbelief. The surveillance footage capturing this horrifying scene would later become a crucial piece of evidence, painting a clear picture of the deadly encounter. The aftermath was chaotic. Henderson crashed the motorcycle and made a desperate attempt to flee on foot, leaving behind a scene that resembled something out of a crime thriller. The rapper, whose ascent in the St. Louis music scene was marked by his inclusion inclusion in the freshman class 2022 had suddenly become the central figure in a real-life drama far removed from the bravado of his lyrics. Charge documents revealed that information from Henderson's cell phone placed him at the scene of the shooting, corroborating the visual evidence. The community was left reeling as the news spread, and the question on everyone's lips was, why? What could have led to such a violent and public display of aggression? Henderson's background provided some context. He had dropped out of Roosevelt High School in ninth grade, and his music, including the popular video Smash, a collaboration with T4, often depicted the harsh realities and the allure of street life. His interview with Chop Talk TV and appearance in vlogger Tommy G's video further solidified his image as a rapper who lived the life he rapped about. The incident brought to light the stark contrast between Henderson's message in the Tommy G video, where he advised to use the same 24 hours wisely, and the actions that led to his arrest. The rapper, who once stood in front of the camera surrounded by peers brandishing firearms, now faced the possibility of spending those hours behind bars, with his initial court appearance marking the beginning of a lengthy legal battle. As Henderson was held without bond pending trial, as the trial commenced, the prosecution presented their case, painting a picture of a cold-blooded killing. The evidence seemed damning, the narrative clear, but as the defense took the floor, the story began to unravel. Henderson's lawyer, a seasoned attorney with a keen eye for detail, challenged the prosecution's narrative, questioning the motives and the circumstances that led to Shaw's death. The defense argued that the state's case was built on shaky ground and that the evidence was circumstantial circumstantial at best. Henderson's presence at the scene, they contended, did not equate to guilt. The argument was bold, the implications far-reaching. Was it possible that Henderson, the rapper whose lyrics spoke of street life and whose videos showcased firearms, was not the trigger man? However, Henderson did indeed shoot Shaw, but not before the rapper felt threatened. According to Henderson's story, he and his friends were riding their minibikes around the city when a white Jeep made a U-turn and started following them. The driver, who turned out to be Shaw, exchanged some tense words with Henderson. Moments later, Henderson heard some shots before he drew his own weapon out of a satchel and returned fire, killing Shaw. Police also discovered a pistol in the Jeep that had been modified to fire two bullets with each pull of the trigger. When recovered, the pistol contained eight spent shell casings, indicating it had been recently fired. I was just doing what I felt I had to do to protect myself, Henderson said. Henderson's lawyer had successfully cast doubt on the prosecution's case, and the young rapper was acquitted of all charges. The evidence was not enough to convict, and Henderson would walk free. Quabo Bells kills man in self-defense. It was September 28, 2019, a day that would forever be etched in the memory of Quabo Bells, a rapper whose journey from the streets to the stage was nothing short of remarkable. But as the saying goes, with great success comes great envy, and Quabo was about to come face to face with the green-eyed monster in human form. Julius Frazier, a name from Quabo's middle school days, re-entered his life with a sinister agenda. Julius had watched Quabo's ascent from afar, and as they reconnected, his congratulations were laced with jealousy. Frazier approached Bells with a mask of camaraderie, reminiscent 
reminiscing about old times and marveling at the rapper's ascent. He spoke of rumors, of whispers that Bells was raking in twenty to thirty thousand dollars per show. It was a conversation laced with admiration, yet underpinned by a palpable tension. Bells, sensing the shift in the air, suggested Fraser check out his new album and attempt to steer the conversation back to safer waters. As fate would have it, Bells' phone began to ring, a simple distraction that would lead to a life-threatening turn. The moment his gaze fell to the device, Fraser seized his opportunity. With a swift and practiced move, he had Bells in a chokehold, a gun pressed cold and menacing against the rapper's temple. The words that followed were a chilling ultimatum. You already know what time it is. Get up. I looked down because my phone started ringing. I grabbed my phone. When I looked back up, bro had put me in a chokehold and put a gun in my head. You feel what I'm saying? Time slowed to a crawl for Bells, his life flashing before his eyes. The possibility of a trigger being pulled was all too real, but surrender was not in his nature. With a calm that belied his racing heart, he addressed his assailant. Bruh, you really gonna try to rob me? It was then that instinct took over. Bells knocked the gun downward, and a struggle ensued. A cacophony of boom, boom, boom as shots rang out. In the chaos, Bells attempted to flee the car, but Frazier relentlessly yanked him back. It was a dance of desperation, each man fighting for control. Bells, now seated, drew his own gun a Glock and fired thrice in rapid succession. The third shot jammed the weapon, but not before Frazier was hit, his screams piercing the air. I, I aimed it at him, and then I just started pulling the trigger. It was it was real fast. I sat back in the seat, boom, and uh, put out my gun, boom, boom, boom. And on the, on the third shot, I heard him like yelling and screaming and shit. Despite his injuries, Frazier fought on, his own gun still in hand, yet eerily silent. Bells couldn't ponder why. His focus was solely on survival. Frazier's threats continued. Let go of the gun or I'm gonna shoot you. But Bells, fueled by adrenaline, broke free and fired again. The altercation ended with Frazier's demise. The man who lay lifeless was 26-year-old Julius Frazier, once a familiar face in the halls of middle school, now a tragic footnote in Bells' journey. The aftermath was a scene straight out of a movie with the smell of gun powder in the air and the sound of sirens approaching. Quabo had defended his life, but the cost was the life of Julius Frazier, the goon from his past who had made the fatal mistake of underestimating him. When the police arrived, the atmosphere was thick with tension and uncertainty. Quabo, his hands still trembling from the shootout, was gripped by the fear of incarceration, the possibility of spending decades behind bars, the prime years of his life wasted away in a cell, was a prospect too harrowing to bear. Yet amidst the chaos, he found a semblance of solace in prayer, placing his fate in the hands of a higher power. The interrogation room was sterile and cold, and the questions came like rapid fire, each probing into the incident's details. The legal system, often unpredictable, was now the judge of whether Quabo's actions were a rightful claim to self-defense or a one-way ticket to a lengthy sentence. But justice on that day seemed to be on Quabo's side. The ruling came down in his favor, self-defense. The relief that washed over him was palpable, a heavy burden lifted. The police, recognizing the clear evidence of Quabo's life being under threat, dropped him back at the scene, a free man. The surreal nature of returning to where his life almost ended was not lost on him. For more content like this, click on the videos showing on your screen now.